I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a professor at the School of Molecular Sciences. So we're here making this video specifically to look at a discussion question in Atkins, his Physical Chemistry for the Life Sciences, uh, edition number two, and a discussion question he has in chapter two, which is introducing the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and uh, this question is uh, explicitly stated as explain the limitations of the following expressions. And he gives three separate uh, expressions. And so I think it might be useful for us just to, you know, go through these kind of one by one. And I think the first thing I will state is, is kind of to restate the question the way I think of it, which is, one of the main things students have as a problem uh, when they're in physical chemistry that I get all the time is, there's all, which equation do I use to solve mm -hmm. a problem? Mm -hmm. and, and which, they get, is, which is the wrong question to ask. It, 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 it complete. And, and what they're so confused of is right here. You know, let's just take this one, entropy. I see at the end of the chapter, it summarizes all the relevant equations, and there's like 10 equations for entropy. Right. Like, which ones do I use in this? in this situation. And why are there 10 different equations for entropy? And you know, the way I like to think of it is there are definitions. For, these are very well defined, but you often are doing things under different assumptions or under different physical conditions, which change you know, uh, the expressions, usually simplifying them in some drastic way. Right, and, and this is why I think it's a, it's a very good idea for students to go back to the basic definition of the concept. Right. For instance, in the case of entropy, if you start by taking the most fundamental definition that you need to compute the heat the amount of heat exchange in a certain process in, done in a reversible way and divided by, the, by temperature. the temperature. If you take this one, you'll never you can, go, you, you will never go never wrong. Go wrong. The, it, the and way eventually, like, eventually you will get the one you have up here, right. as you are saying. Right, the way I like to, you know, to put in a, in a different way, I almost always, in fact, if anyone asks me one thing I only remember out of thermodynamics, I I. I always remember, you know, the first law, and like you said, I think we both write it the same, that, that it's the change in work and heat and that those are path dependent, and that's why we kind of put the squiggly. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, this internal energy, um, you know, the, the first work, uh, you know, we, we typically see is, is something, but it can be a lot of different work terms. You know, we'll just leave this the same. But this always comes, you know, when it's reversible as TDS, right? Right. So it's, you know, it's always going to come as a TDS term here for what this is in a reversible, you know, system. Right. It, and it is remarkable yeah. that you can write for the change, the, the first law, the reversible plus dq reversible and you can write also as dq irreversible plus dq irreversible yeah because this quantity here is going to be path independent so whether you go reversibly or irreversibly it doesn't make any difference whereas for the definition of entropy to make it a path independent quantity because it involves only heat exchange, you have to make it reversible because otherwise, because it doesn't involve the, 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 the work term. This is the difference between these two. So now you have to make it reversible so that actually the, 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 the entropy becomes actually a path independent quantity. Right. So what are, you know, to, to help define this, like you said, like, um, you know, what are the major, well, you know, one of the things I always like people to remember, we write things as general, you know, exact differentials. And now it's putting it as a delta, right? So that means you integrated at some, and you had to integrate this given that it was the heat over temperature. That's what you see when you integrate a one on temperature. 
it means that this heat capacity had to have been temperature independent for it to, for this equation to hold. The, the heat capacity could have had a temperature dependence, which would have, you know, not allowed it to come through that integral. So, you know, some of the limitations or what I would call assumptions in this equ equation is, is that it has a, a, a temperature independent heat capacity. And, you know, it's not it, it's stating explicitly which one it is, you know, but you can almost you know, tell like that what they're really assuming here is the pressure. Right. E either that or if you... So what, 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 you want me to erase, erase for you? please. No, no problem. Yes. Now we'll see we how well we can, we can erase this. I think we're doing good. Yeah. Right. Because Let what me, you just said. Okay. We, we have two options here. Either we consider, actually we have more options, but okay. I'll get you to a pen and you should be good. Yeah, either we consider the entropy to be a function of T and V, or we consider the entropy to be a function of T and P. So, so, th so this is exactly yeah, what you were saying. Assuming a closed system where there's no change in the number of moles, right? right? Where exactly, there's no change exactly. in the number of moles, just other, to be other, kind yeah, of explicit, other, other, or any other work, any other. other type otherwise, of work. we need to include here in the, right, yeah, yeah. right. So, if we have it this way, then dS is going to be dS dT constant v dT plus dS d v constant t d v yeah. and now if we compare these two in a sense just taking the partial of each exactly. of its dependent exactly. variables which you can always do that's exactly. one of the beauties of thermodynamics exactly because of because of the fact that you only have here the temperature dependent for the change in entropy either v was constant Sense. Or if or, you, oops, oops, uh, oops, I'll go back. Or, or, or I, I think we can even state without having to write the second one. Right. Or you can tell in the second one, p, p was will constant. have to be constant. Exactly. Exactly. So, in, so the the other limitation. Explain the limitation of the following expression: that the heat capacity was is constant. It's assumed to be constant here. Yeah. And either v or p was constant. So right. which give, leads us to the conclusion that c has to be either heat capacity at constant pressure, pressure. or heat capacity at constant, constant volume. volume. So in fact, we need here to specify that. Right. And, and this is what we do with this sub-index, cons constant pressure, constant right. volume. But, you know, that does put, you know, that the, there's temperature independence of the heat capacity, that there are these things. So this isn't, a, you know, the most general equation at all for entropy. It is only under very specific Exactly. assumptions or in this case limitations that it holds and I I think we've kind of outlined some of those okay let's move on to the next one and uh, um, I guess the way I would look at this is you know there's there's two general things I think of everyone thinks of if, if somebody says Delta G gives free energy in chemistry and biochemistry to me they come up with one of two things they either start thinking of equilibrium constants Right? Like, so, so basically chemical potential, like that it's the molar, you know, the, the, the molar free energy is, a chemi is related to a chemical potential, right? Uh, so they start writing that, you know, delta G and how it's related to, um, you know, an equilibrium constant or, you know, this expression, which is, you know, how, it's how you can split this free energy up into kind of enthalpic terms and entropic terms. Both are so important in chemistry and biochemistry. Right. So I think it's critical to look at this one. Now, the way I initially think of this again as just like before in entropy, you like to start with where it's always correct. And the thing I think of when I the definition of, of the Gibbs free energy is, is that it is the internal energy plus PV minus TS. And this, in a sense, you know, a double Legendre transform on energy to give the, the dependent variables right. of internal energy away from entropy, volume, and number of moles to something that's more 
tangible from an experimental standpoint. Temperature, pressure, right. and number. And he puts the, the, the emphasis, let me just mention that here. For a, a given thermodynamic transformation, we need, we know that the general rule for reversible or irreversible process is that delta S of the universe equal to delta S of system plus delta S of the environment. This guy, this quantity has to be larger or equal to zero. It is very interesting that we can write an expression like this that concentrates on this on system only at constant P and constant T. Exactly equivalent to this is delta G. Yeah. Smaller. So so the so the change in free energy replaces has the same amount of information as this expression Russian which for is for entropy for for the and total en entropy, entropy system plus and, and it, 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 over and over again no matter what energy we're talking about whether in this case it's the gibbs free energy whether it's an energy like enthalpy that we often use to, to, to express heat, you know, but it's an energy, whether it's the internal energy, we're often this, this max, you know, this, this in a sense, um, you know, maximum in the uh, entropy is often our minimum in energies that we're looking for. And, it, it, you know, that tangible, um, you know, connection yeah, is so uh, important absolutely. to make. Absolutely, and there is one that we never use because it's not convenient from the experimental point of view that if we have a transformation where the total entropy is constant, then exactly as you're saying, the equilibrium and irreversibility condition transforms into the energy, the total energy being a minimum. Yeah. And, but and we never use it because it's, it's, it's not convenient from the experimental point right. of view. With when I think it, it, you know, I won't say it's, it's lost, but it's something we all quickly just, we mentioned it at the start of thermodynamics that we're, we're going to be talking about equilibrium, reversible thermodynamics for so much of, of, of undergraduate level. And, and it's like we, we, we quickly almost forget those assumptions are being made in a lot of our yeah, equations absolutely. when it's so important to remember this. I like to just, you know, remind that this is the definition of H, right? So um, I'll quickly, uh, I think it's somewhat important just to, you know, remind students that, um, you know, I think you know, this is sometimes the power of just, you know, remembering some just basic, you know, mathematics. So you can, in a sense, write this definition as H minus. You can see how it's getting, you know, to that right there. Uh, At constant temperature. Well, right. right now we haven't assumed anything. We can, we can say that this is DH minus D. TS, and that holds under any conditions, right? And in fact, you know, um, you can see why it has to be because if you distribute this minus SDT, the only way you get from there to what this is is to assume, you know, a constant temperature here and now integrate to say that this is minus, and since we're at constant temperature, this would come. You know, to get exactly. this, that's in a sense how we would derive that. But you're right, you cannot, this, the limitation or the assumption in this expression is constant temperature in this, in this case. Yep. So, okay, let's quickly also look at the third one. And, um, you know, I think this goes kind of almost in the same direction as we were going with the last one, except one further, right? which is um, now it's not only a limitation of constant temperature, but also constant pressure uh, to get rid of any type of what I think of as mechanical or ex uh, yeah. expansion type of mechanical work. Mechanical PV work or non -exp or expansion work. work. In the system. And um, so, you know, that would be the assumptions made to, to be able to you know, write that uh, this work. Yeah, from. probably just to, to clarify the, the expansion Expansion. This term here is non-expansion. So the the expansion work is would be minus PDV. P external dV. Right. So this is the the, the, the expression. And of, and I think this is actually I, I love that you mentioned this that it, it you know this is how it's defined as the external. We 
a, you know, half the time you rarely see that in books really well explicitly stated that it's the external pressure because it's assuming that the internal pressure and the external pressure are equilibrated. Which is not this, the case except if the process is reversed. First of all, and, but you know, oftentimes you'll just hear it called PDV work, PDV right. work, right? right? right, right. Uh, and and it, it's very important to remember that it's the external pressure that it's going to uh, Right, um, because this is work done by the external system the, the environments on the system or by the system on the environment. Right. So the ex it's only for the for the reversible case where you can actually say that the pressure is equal to the external pressure, meaning that you are changing the pressure by infinitesimal steps. Otherwise, you don't have this equality. Right. The last thing I like to mention here is, like I said, the only literally the, I think the only equation I I remember in thermodynamics. Uh, you know, is, is the first law, but I, but I always remember that, you know, in, in these reversible cases, it's, you know, heat is TDS. Uh, we're almost always, you know, uh, no, expansion work is PDV. And then a lot of people will just write that the, it's the extra, you know, it's, it's everything else. And this right. could be, you know, this could be the sum on mu I D N I. Uh, this could be, you know, an electric, uh, field into a dipole. This could be a magnetic, magnetic moment uh, into a magnetic field. Or a gravitational field. field. Yeah, it could be a lot of different things. And so, you know, when I think of uh, G, and again, this is where mathematics really helps. And, and I ha we have whole math sections to go through the Legendre transforms, but I always just remember the trick of, of flip, you know, uh, flip the sign and flip the variables, right? Like flip the sign and flip the variables you know, gives you that. And if you're under constant temperature and pressure, then everything else is all those, you know, extra um, work terms that, that right. is what gets to this. And, and this is so extremely important because <laughs> this expression gives you the capability, the ability to compute how much work you need to do, you can extract from the system or what is the minimum amount of work you need to perform a transformation of the system? Yeah. It's either way. How much work you can extract? This is the maximum amount of work you can extract from the system or the minimum amount of work you have to put to get it back to where you want. Yeah. And this is so important because, for instance, in the case of a biological system, let's say a cell. You have a cell, you have the membrane, and there is transport from the, the interior of the cell to the exterior and the other way around. Now, this transport involves perhaps ions, like, yeah. and then this transport occurs under an electrochemical potential. And it is this work that comes in here because this is not, ex this is not expansion work right. in this particular case. There so can be reactions that get chemical be work. There can be, and, and these are mainly, this is most of what we're going to spend our time with in chemistry, right. in biochemistry, right? And it also tells you, I mean, it's not explicit here, that in thermodynamics you have a criterion for whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. But it doesn't mean that you cannot have the non-spontaneous reactions. You, you can always do that, but you have to pay for it. And what you pay is this external work or energy that you have to apply to get what the system wouldn't do spontaneously. Initially itself. Yeah. Oh. I think uh, this gives a good uh, dialogue description of, of some of these uh, where we've really tried to highlight what some of the limitations are. And these really are three expressions or equations that are critical in thermodynamics. But I think it, it you know, why this makes a very good discussion is understanding the limitations or what the assumptions are in each of these cases is really at the heart of understanding the thermodynamics that the, you're using. This is why, and, and probably we, we both want to emphasize that, this is why having a list of equations and trying to pick up the one you need, this is always a mistake. What you need is few fundamental concepts, understand the limitations, and then try to work from the basic right. equations to when get I, what you need. I think we both started from the same point today. I mean, there's a reason that the, you know, they st most thermodynamic books, including this one, you know, has a whole chapter on the first law, the whole f chapter on the second law. It, you know, the combined first, second law is almost the beginning of anywhere I derive any thermodynamic Absolutely. equation. So.
Thanks for the discussion. No, today. thanks to you, Jeff.